So I'm Gail Ashton. Uh, I'm a wildlife photographer, writer and illustrator with a love of all nature and a special interest in insects and other invertebrates. Um, I've had photos published in books and magazines, um, as well as editorial articles. And my first book, um, A Guide to the Garden Insects of Great Britain and Northwest Europe, co-written with Dominic Cousins and published by John Beaufoy, is released in June um, and is available for pre-order now. Dominic is here tonight. Um, hi, Dominic. Um, and he will join us for the Q&A after the presentation. So thanks for joining us, Dominic. So um, in this presentation, I'll talk about uh, what a healthy habitat looks like in a garden, uh, the kinds of insects that we can find in our outdoor spaces, uh, where we might find them, um, a little bit about how climate change is altering what, it, what insects will visit our gardens and how that will look possibly in a few years time. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, um, I'll use common names where available uh, and a lot of these insects tonight are quite common and conspicuous so uh, I'll use the common names. Um, my pronunciation of scientific names could be a little bit arbitrary um, so <laughs> bear with me on that um, and this kind of this presentation does kind of scratch the surface of uh, the insect life in your garden or outdoor space and um, there is so much to discover but hopefully you'll get a, a good introduction to what's out there. So um, what is a habitat? Well in ecological terms a habitat is an area that meets the needs of one or more species. Um, the wider garden habitat can also include several smaller or micro habitats uh, each of which support different communities uh, so these can include hedges, grass, uh, pond, log pile, etc., and others, it's not an exhaustive list. Um, in garden terms, the better the habitat, the more wildlife will visit. So why are our gardens important habitats? Um, well, sources differ slightly on this, but there are approximately 23 million private gardens in the UK. Um, some are huge, some are tiny, um, all different sizes, all different shapes in all different places. Um, add on to that all the, the courtyards, the balconies, the allotments, the window boxes, uh, the side alleys, etc. And it's an area roughly the size of all our national parks combined. So there's a lot of biodiversity potential in our gardens um, and the, habit the opportunities for habitat creation are huge. So um, what can a garden habitat look like? Well, there are various ways we can do it. Here are two contrasting examples. Um, the first is my mum's small but very beautiful garden uh, up north. And uh, the second one, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, is uh, a much bigger um, purpose-built project, if you like. Um, so there's a few key words here that I'll, I'll keep using, things like polyculture and biodiversity, um, zoning, um, what things are where, uh, how you, know, uh, you can divide up your garden into different zones that will uh, support different um, species, um, native planting, uh, gentle management, and a big thing for me is soil access. Um, it's a big thing for all life really, um, and that's, that's a really vital thing that I'll probably keep talking about. Um, so my mum's garden, the first one, um, it's, it's very small, but it's got a range of herbaceous plants and borders and containers. It's got lots of successional flowering, grasses, ferns, shrubs and a tree. Um, can I just talk about how amazing my mum is as a gardener for an hour? I'll do that instead. <laughs> She's, it's really lovely and it really does support um, and foraging for lots of solitary and social bees, butterflies, moths, flies. Uh, and to my mum's dismay, lily beetles. Um, she does not like them at all, and I drive her mad when I go, look at that, it's so gorgeous, she doesn't like them. Um, so this small container format can be adapted into any size space, and it importantly provides some soil access. So if you're working on a balcony, even that one little container has some soil access, it all matters. Um, in the second garden, this is a garden that I spent last summer photographing, and recording. Um, it's suburban um, uh, in my hometown. It's a very large garden and it was a huge landscaping project um, which essentially turned a um, 
a tra traditional lawn garden into what can only be described as a nature reserve. It's, it's an extraordinary project. Um, it's got uh, mixed habitat and a large scale uh, for a garden, including shaded woodland. Um, it's got three ponds of differing sizes, and it's actually got a chalk bank as well with chalk specific um, plant species, which is now attracting chalk specific insect species. It's, it's amazing. There's a great species richness, uh, masses of invertebrates and amphibians and reptiles. Um, this is way out of reach for the majority of people, um, but it is a great example of how habitat can be created and there are no limits to the imagination. So it can be done on a small and a large scale. Um, a garden habitat also looks like this. Uh, you can have overgrown gardens. They are, they are common. Uh, some owners just cannot maintain them and some choose to leave their gardens uh, and rewild them. Uh, I visited a rewilded garden um, just further down in the county in Hertfordshire, which has uh, some really rare species in there. It's a, it's a haven for wildlife. Um, and it's a fantastic example of a, re a rewilded garden. Some gardens can um, sometimes become dominated by one or two species, which can suppress biodiversity a little bit. But it is still great shelter and it links up if it, you know, these um, more, more wilderness areas link up all of the other gardens, it's, it's great mosaic habitat, that variety of habitat. And um, the scrub that grows up there, the brambles and the shrubs um, are really good for birds and insects. Um, for example, bramble, dogwood, um, spindle, things like that. And there's less disturbance to wildlife, so it's more likely to harbour um, reptiles and mammals, which are also supported by insects. It also looks like this. What's really important is that everybody can create a habitat, no matter how large or small. Um, those of us with garden, gardens are so lucky. Um, many people in the UK don't have one. Think of all the urban areas and certainly, you know, um, throughout Europe and the world, um, you'll find I'm just sort of concentrating on the UK tonight. Um, but a small courtyard or a balcony can harbour a microhabitat and communities of insects, which can then uh, ripple out into the, the wider ecosystem. Loving wildlife and the ability to support it should be available to every, everybody, regardless of circumstances. And again, these um, more lush green balconies, courtyards, um, can be part of those key corridors for flying insects to link up their habitats. Um, so you've got a range of containers, you've got a bit of polyculture in there, you can even have um, small pond areas, you can have a washing up bowl with some stones and pebbles in it. Um, you really, again, it's all about imagination. And I love the imagination and determination here to create these green urban spaces. Um, a healthy garden doesn't look like this though. Um, I won't dwell on this too much, but... Um, as I've said, soil is critical for a healthy habitat and there is just no soil access. If you put down plastic grass, um, I'm sure I'm talking to people who are all on the same page with this. Um, it removes the foundation of the food web. So plastic landscapes offer no food or shelter, nesting support for insects or indeed any other species. Um, it removes that critical life support for so many animals, that soil layer, which obviously um, supports the plants and the larger animals. Uh, obviously chemicals, swell, insecticides, etc., also destroy habitat. Um, it's just not a great way to share, uh, great way to share our outdoor spaces with nature, is it really? Um, and I do get a little riled by the concreted and astroturf gardens that have bird feeders in them. It feels a bit like, oh, just give them some soil. They will feed themselves. Um, so why are insects important? Uh, insects and invertebrates are the whole or part of the natural diet of most other wild animals. Um, hedgehogs and foxes eat large quantities of beetles and such like. Lizards and frogs and toads eat a variety of insects and invertebrates. Uh, and in spring, the swifts arrive, the swallows, the house martins, uh, they arrive just in time for the emergence of the mayflies, midges, mosquitoes, etc. Creating habitats for insects creates the foundation of a healthy food web. 
Um, so a little example of a food web in my garden. Um, please don't worry uh, if you can't read all the elements of this web. It is just for illustration purposes only. Um, I made it for an ecology essay I produced last year. It's the arrows I want you to focus on. Um, if you're not as familiar with food webs, um, I just want to show you the incredible complexity and interconnectedness of many of our outdoor um, and many of the species our outdoor spaces can support. Except I have noticed that I didn't put caterpillars in it, which are quite important. Although if I did, my uh, might have missed it. It shows you how many there are and how complex it is. Um, if you add on amphibians and reptiles and, uh, and things that are in other gardens as well, it, that web grows even further. Um, so I think in this web here, the uh, insects are mainly in blue and orange. Uh, you've got parasiti uh, parasites and parasitoids in green, and they're all interconnected in some way. Um, so microhabitats support all these species, showing how important polyculture and varied habitat are. That variety is really vital. Um, so here is um, a photograph of uh, the food web happening in my garden. So this is a solitary wasp, uh, an Ancestrosaurus species that I found um, lurking in the foliage around some knapweed stems, I think they were. And uh, all of a sudden it became very busy and I couldn't work out why. And luckily I had my camera with me, although I wish I'd videoed it, it was amazing. And it sort of sniffed around, for want of a better word, um, this plant stem. And then all of a sudden with surgical precision, just made this incision down the plant stem, split it open and pulled out this little caterpillar, this little micro moth caterpillar, um, pulled it out. The caterpillar did put up a fight but lost and um, the caterpillar was almost the same size as, as this wasp and the wasp hauled it out and took it off to its nest to provision um, for its young. So there is stuff going on all over in, in a garden. It's an incredible little uh, universe. Um, so climate change is altering the invertebrate landscape and it will be reflected in the insects you see in your gardens over the coming decades. Uh, flying, in, flying insects are effective indicators of climate shift as they are so mobile and they'll move with fluctuations in weather patterns. So the, the map roughly shows you that as temperatures start to keep rising, they are already rising, but as they keep rising that they will um, shift insect populations and different species over from the continent further up into the west and north of the country. So many of our flying species are making a relatively short trip across the channel. Um, they're finding our increasingly milder winters rather pleasant and staying put. Uh, but on the other hand, insects that are acclimatised to, uh, to colder temperatures could be pushed up towards the northern tip of our isles and they'll find their geographical range of tolerance shrinking. In other words, they'll have nowhere to go. So that's not good news for them. So here are a few um, of the, I'd say the winners of climate change, uh, insects that have come over in the last couple of years or decades and are establishing themselves. Um, so the ivy bee uh, was only found here in the early 90s, um, or described here, it's probably had been around a little bit longer, but it, um, it's enjoyed a rapid successful expansion northwards and I think it's north of um, Lancashire and Cheshire now. Um, Juliana and Gary will um, be more specific about that if they've got it up there. Um, it's still heading north. It's really happy because it's got so much of its food plant um, ivy. Uh, it's, you'll see it foraging really late in the year on ivy flowers. Uh, the large headed resin bee at the bottom left that was listed as rare until recently it is now i'd say quite common um, in my area and it is very much enjoying things as they are over here at the moment so that is also expanding through west and north through the country um, slowly the bee wolf is the same um, top right that's an amazing solitary wasp um, it's uh, this is a male that you can see here with it, that uh, lovely little crown shape on its forehead um, but the female is a real beast and she's the one that will hunt down ambush paralyze and carry off honeybees 
to the nest. And that's quite a sight when you see um, a double decker bee wolf and honeybee. Um, they're, they're amazing. Um, that is uh, in the southwest and expanding, but that might be slightly more confined by the sandy uh, soil, really loose sandy soil that they need to build their um, large aggregations. So I, I'm wondering whether we might see those as a more coastal species up north uh, in coming years and decades. Um, the Rosal's bush cricket at the bottom, which is has that distinctive uh, white sort of edge to, it's like a collar uh, around a pronotum. Uh, it's a little bush cricket that is also enjoying a, a range expansion uh, through the southern counties. That likes undisturbed long grass, as most grasshoppers do, so uh, bush cricket, sorry, um, which is a bush cricket. Uh, but it will uh, settle in any gardens that have that longer grass. Um, so you may be seeing that. And finally, the tree snipe fly, which I just put in for my own pleasure. Um, I, it's... Uh, a county first that I found a few years ago, um, not in a garden, in a nature reserve, but it's a really sort of good indicator of um, our warming temperatures and how such a delicate little fly is able to cope with what should be colder temperatures, but we can see that the, there are weather pattern shifts, so that is uh, more comfortable in this country and probably will continue to expand because the temperatures don't seem to be going down anytime soon. So what is an insect? Um, so here's a table of uh, taxonomy and it, this just shows us how you can split um, animals from being um, cells to uh, the complex biodiversity that we see now. Um, just to explain to you if you're not sure how an insect is different to other animals. So um, you have the, you've got the domain, um, the kingdom, the phylum, the class, the order, the family, the genus and the species, which I always try and remember as uh, from D down to S, definitely keep precious creatures organised for grumpy scientists. And that's how I remember it. So domain eukarya is what we are as well, uh, as opposed to bacteria or archaea. Um, we have a membrane bound nucleus cell structure. Uh, animal um, kingdom, animalia, that is us as well. We are motile, we move, we're multicellular, we um, reproduce sexually, although that is increasingly being found to not be the case in a lot of the animal kingdom, so that is constantly changing. And we are holozoic feeders and have a through gut, so basically a mouth, a digestive system and a bum um, to poo things out of, and that's the same with insects. We split off here um, and you get the arthropods, which are um, the segmented uh, uh, animals, that are invertebrates, which have um, uh, like millipedes, they have segmented bodies. Uh, they've got this chitin based exoskeleton um, and jointed legs. And then that splits off into other things like the millipedes and centipedes, etc. And then you've got the insect class, which is known for having a three-sectioned body of the head, thorax and the abdomen. It has antennae a very different um, uh, designs, for want of a better word, and wings. And most insects have two pairs of wings, but evolution has done different things with those wings, which we'll, um, we'll look at in a minute. They've been evolved in different ways for different purposes. So that's basically what an insect is, um, apart from the fact that they are awesome. So the main common insect groups that you're likely to find in your garden are these ones. Um, it's not an exhaustive list and there will be other ones, but um, the majority of them will be things like the Odonata, the dragons and damselflies, the Orthoptera, which are grasshoppers and bush crickets, the Hymenoptera, which are the bees, wasps, ants and sawflies, the Hemiptera, which are tree bugs. Um, bugs is a catch-all word generally for all insects and invertebrates. Uh, but these are the true bugs. Uh, the Lepidoptera are butterflies and moths. Coleoptera are the beetles and the Diptera are the true flies. So hopefully you'll get a little, little bit of all of those in your outdoor spaces. Um, so here is um, a little bit of entomological etymology, which I, uh, I've always wanted to say that. Uh, 
this is, these are a few examples of the main insect orders and the sort of the etymology of their names, which can be a useful ID tool. It sort of tells you why, you know, explains why they look like they look, how they look. So terra is translated from green as uh, uh, wing, P-T-E-R-A. And then it's split into the different groups. So you can see you've got the coleoptera, for example. So col um, coleo means sheath. Um, that explains how the wings, the, I think it's the four wings, have become a, a hard casing, the elytra uh, of the beetles, and um, that big hardened back that makes them like little tanks. Uh, the diptera, two-winged. Um, they're one pair of their wings has been reduced to a tiny little um, pair, pair of sort of paddle-like appendages on the sides of their bodies, which uh, don't aren't used for actual flying now, but they are flight stabilizers and they help to orient uh, the orientate the fly within its space and help stabilize it when flying. The hemiptera, um, the uh, wings are hardened near the bay um, near the base and they are look more membranous near the tip so that's like a half wing looks like half a wing and the hymenoptera have very membranous wings they do have two pairs of flight wings uh, and uh, that's a really good ID uh, a way to ID them especially from flies that might look quite similar um, the lepidoptera um, the um, uh, moths and butterflies have scale wings because their wings are made of, uh, they're covered in tiny, tiny scales, which are often iridescent, which can be used uh, as camouflage or to be conspicuous or both. We're still finding out loads about why they are like they are. Uh, and then the odon odonata, which means strong teeth, that big strong jaw that it's got. And that's actually split into two suborders of Anisoptera, which is dragonflies, and Zygoptera, which is damselflies. And that means different sized wings. So. Uh, what isn't an insect? So there are other non-insect invertebrates that will share our outdoor spaces and are just as critical to our ecosystems. Um, the spiders, uh, they are known for having eight legs. Uh, they have a two-part body, which is the kef kephalothorax, which is the um, front end, that big bit that you can see on the left, a nice rounder bit, and then the back end, which is the abdomen. They also have chelicera, which are mouth parts, and pedipalps, which are limb-like appendages out of the front of the face, which are used for um, uh, sensory, their sensory organs. Um, millipedes. Uh, and centipedes are part of the myriapoda. They um, are a bit insect-like, but they have many, many legs and many segments. Uh, the harvestmen look like spiders. They are part of the arachnida, um, in, um, arachnida animals, but they have a single segment body and very, very spindly legs. So you will often see those in your gardens. Uh, many of these are found more at soil level in darker, damper habitats. Obviously, spiders can be found in, in a wider range of habitats than that. Uh, so hopefully here are some ones you'll know. Uh, these are some familiar garden faces. They're also seen in public parks and urban areas. Um, they are common and widespread, uh, mainly because they're generalists. They, they're tolerant of a wide range of conditions. They're very adaptable. That's what's made, the, made them successful. And that's why most of us will see them. So. Um, I'd just like you to let me know if you know what they are in the comments box. It should be fairly easy, most of these. Um, just pop your answers in the comments box and uh, Liana, if you could uh, just give me some feedback on that, that'd be great. Okay, so we've got peacock butterfly. That's a bit. Uh -huh. yeah, everyone's being a bit shy. <laughs> <laughs> Honeybee. Yeah. Sunspot ladybird. Yeah. Red Admiral. Yeah, brilliant. Anyone know what the top right one is? Blue bottle. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, it's a, it's a green bottle. It's a blowfly, well done. So yeah, these, you've got peacock butterfly, you've got the uh, common wasp, uh, which we all know um, in the top uh, center. Uh, top right is one of the Lucilia blowflies. Um, which will always be around, especially if there's something died in the garden, if there's a dead bird or something, you will always see, see them um, recycling it. 
uh, Seven Spot Ladybird, bottom left, Red Admiral, bottom centre, and the Honeybee, uh, bottom right. Here are some you might not. Can anybody uh, hazard a guess as to what any of these might be? Some are more familiar than others. We've got shield bug. Yeah, well done. Rosemary beetle. Yeah. Shield bug. <laughs> Drone fly. Oh, not bad guess. Not quite. It's a kind of bee. I'm assuming you're talking about the one on the right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So these, yeah, these are all likely to be in a lot of your gardens and outdoor spaces but you might not see them as often um, and the, the funny thing is looking at them all they're not all to scale some are much smaller than others so they're not all the same size um, so the first one is a hawthorn shield bug yeah that's found mainly in hawthorn because the young eat the berries but they are also present in other broadleaf trees and will find their way into nearby gardens so um, that one and several other shield bug species um, you will definitely see at some point and they have that amazing um, resinous buzzing as they um, as they fly around you and they're quite clumsy so they don't sound like any other insect um, so once you tune into them you'll know even if it flies behind you that it's a shield bug um, secondly is the frog hopper um, frog hoppers the common frog hoppers are very common in gardens uh, they will um, visit a wide range of plants. They're known as spittle bugs because they lay their eggs in that protective foamy blob that they secrete, which you'll probably know as cuckoo spit. So if you see that, it looks like somebody spat on um, plant foliage. That's actually containing uh, an egg or a nymph of a frog hopper. So um, yeah, look out for that. Uh, yeah, the rosemary beetle, um, it's a relatively recent site in gardens, uh, but is on the increase. Uh, it does divide gardeners somewhat. They think it might cause damage, but there's no real evidence of that. I, I just think they're amazing. I do actually sometimes um, pick a couple off a nearby um, lavender plant and try and translocate them, but they don't seem to like my garden as much for some reason. Um, they are very much like a ladybird, same kind of size as a seven spot, um, but they are fantastically iridescent. Uh, they're such an amazing um, little rainbow and you can't miss them, especially in the sunshine. They shine like little jewels um, and it likes lavender as much as it likes rosemary, interestingly. And finally is a wool carder bee which you might not know you have, but if you've got lamb's ear, Stachys byzantina in your garden, you probably will have the wool carder bee um, because it's fiercely territorial over it, which we will go into a little bit later on. Um, these species are a little bit more choosy, so that they'll be more likely to be present if certain food plants and nest sites are available. Um, so which do you think is the most important garden habitat? Time for a poll. There's no right or wrong answer. I'd really just like to know what your thoughts are. If you were to prioritize a garden habitat, what would you choose? Ponds are very popular. Oh, wow. Oh, that's interesting. We've got quite a spread. A lot of support for mature trees and shrubs. Pond is ahead. Well, thanks everybody for putting your votes in. That's a really interesting spread. Um, yeah, the ideally we'd have all of them. Um, a little bit of everything is is ideal, um, and the best way to support biodiversity. Um, but even one of these will help. Even that bowl of water on a balcony with some pebbles and wood in it or, and a couple of small containers of oregano or wallflowers will start to support species um, but yeah uh, our ideal scenario is that every garden in the country had just a little bit of everything so thank you for that Liana do I have to click off that Liana uh, yeah you'll probably need to remove it from the screen thanks <clears throat> 
So what do insects need? Um, what makes a good garden habitat? Uh, for everything, it's um, the vital resources are food, shelter and nesting. Uh, so here we can see a range of solitary bee, for example, uh, nesting opportunities. Um, so we've got a very DIY uh, log with some holes drilled in it. This is actually a video, so hopefully this will start to play now. Oh, you might have some soundtrack behind there. Somebody getting in the car. Um, so this is a leaf cutter bee, and it's um, taking a circle of leaf that it's cut out of a uh, plant into its hole and then at some point I get distracted by the large-headed resin bee that's just on the side there um, and there goes the leaf cutter to take some more to go and get some more leaf so it likes quite large holes and there's a couple of other things in there there's been some mason bees in and then lower down you can see some nice stuffed cells in those those holes down there so um, they're quite resourceful they will um, they will find a hole that they like the size of and they will use it um, you can get custom bee uh, custom built bee hotels uh, so that in the center of the picture you'll see that there's a lovely um, shiny new bee hotel which is uh, for th th that one is more for mason bees uh, but you can get little inserts for the resin bees and smaller bees as well and then on the left just in the shade you'll see my DIY version of it that's basically a, a fence post with some holes drilled in it and that's been quite successful. Uh, top right is a bee bank which not, not all of you may have thought of putting in your garden uh, this is an idea I got from Stephen Falk um, the bee, uh, bee king it's a, a bee bank and it's basically a parabolic mound of sandy soil, sand mixed with soil uh, in the sunniest part of the garden in full sun, which is um, an aspect that lots of mining bees and solitary wasps really love. So it's now, it doesn't look like that now, it's got thrift and um, some uh, thyme planted in it uh, to give some root system, but there's a lot of insect act activity in that which is really good um, and it's just something that I wouldn't have normally had in my garden because I don't have sandy soil so I've tried introducing it to see what happens and there have been some good results um, so I'll see what happens with that over the next couple of years. Uh, in the bottom right there's uh, some soft paving with no membrane under it so it goes bananas I do have to spend a lot of time pulling large weeds out of it otherwise we can't get onto the terrace. Um, but that is um, the gaps in between those paving slabs with that sandy soil again are great for mining bees and other ground level invertebrates. So I'm just trying to pack as many insects into my garden as possible. Um, so, but insects do decide where is right for them. It's not always inexpensive bee hotels. So um, mason bees are quite opportunistic and any old screw holes in brickwork uh, will be uh, used if they're right, if they feel right to them, uh, and they will use any kind of bee hotel if it's in the right place and it's got the right size holes. Um, top right, you can see a little volcano of soil there with a hole in the middle. So that's where a grey patched mining bee uh, uh, dug a nest tunnel in that terrace I was just talking about with the no membrane, so it's a, a living living terrace breathing as well with all the soil in it um, and if you see what little volcanoes like that it will be mining bees you've got black ants uh, that will uh, colonize compost bins uh, which I never mind um, it's always been interesting to open your compost bin and see lots of diversity in there um, I accidentally disturbed this one I think this one was in my mum's compost bin and um, they were quite furious with me uh, the, the ants not my parents and uh, we're busy shuffling around their larvae to get them to safety. Um, so they will colonize darker areas like that or under flagstones. Um, the Queen Hornet uh, was the surprise of last year when I um, checked um, under uh, the lid of a nest box and found her building her nest. And I was absolutely, I was just over the moon. I was so delighted. And I just watched her build these nest cells and lay her eggs in them. And I was so excited, but not really thinking about what it would be like if I had uh, an entire colony of worker hornets at the bottom of my small garden. Um, I didn't think about that then, but I was just so excited that she'd 
um, honoured me with her presence. Um, but it didn't last long, though, because uh, about a week later, I found her. Uh, she'd been assassinated by a false widow spider. I think it was a false widow. I can't imagine what else could possibly take down a, female, a, queen, wath, a queen hornet. Um, so that was the end of that. So I was quite sad, but it's just, they're just beautiful creatures and I find them very fascinating. Um, and finally, the large headed resin bees uh, will take up residence in uh, smaller holes, bamboo canes. They're quite opportunistic as well. As long as the size of the hole is right, um, they will they will move in. You'll all get, also get some surprises. Um, this utter chaos is a buff-tail bumblebee nest that just happened over one summer in my garage. Um, I don't really know what's going on here. You can see you make out some nest cells and it's very multicolored, but it was started inside, inside some rubble bags by a single queen and developed into this volleyball sized nest full of individual cells. Um, it looks appalling, doesn't it? But she clearly liked the conditions and she raised a very successful generation. Um, there were bees in and out, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bees in and out all summer. Um, I finally pulled this out in autumn uh, when I knew that the nest was completely finished. And um, it looked like this and it had a really strong smell to it. I feel really bad that she had a plastic based nest, but it just goes to show you that these insects are independent and they know what they want. And if it's something works for them, they'll go for it. Um, but that was extraordinary. So just um, to talk briefly about zoning. Um, making different areas in your garden that have different um, facilities, shall we say, and fulfill different, different needs. Um, zones are areas that provide different resources and meet, meet different needs for wildlife. Um, so you've got, you've got water, whether it's a massive pond or a balcony hoverfly lagoon or a bucket in the ground, that will attract aquatic insects. Um, such as mosquito larvae and drone fly larvae, which will then bring in predators and bolster the food web and in turn, hopefully support amphibians, bats, swift swallows, etc. cetera. Um, on the right is a wood pile. Now, often people put wood piles in shady places, but wood piles in sunny places can be really helpful as well and really supportive. Um, so the shady, damp, dark spaces uh, are good for the damp loving invertebrates, um, springtails, um, the centipedes, wood lice, and some of the um, damp loving uh, ground beetles, etc. But the sunny, dry, light areas are perfect for the sunbathers, for, for example, the bee flies, uh, the mason bees, hoverflies, wolf spiders, etc. Um, I've got brambles growing through this, um, which provide a good nectar source in midsummer. Um, and um, the bug hotel behind it, the very makeshift bug hotel, um, has often harboured dunnock, other garden birds, which are uh, thrushes, which will go through looking for invertebrates and mollusks. Um, so it creates that ripple of support. Other zones can include things like shrub and tree canopy, um, small grassland, unmown areas. So polyculture is really important, uh, that variety of flowers, successional flowers that will go through the season from early spring, right through even winter flowering um, plants that will support those really hardy insect species that come out later um, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the colder months. Um, so longer grass for orthoptera, this is, this is my mess of a garden. Um, nothing has, apart from the bottom, centre picture, nothing has been planted, it's all just done its own thing and I quite like that. So expanding on the food web, here's an example of a micro habitat, so you've got the pond illustrated in blue in the bottom corner and we'll see a succession of species, water is introduced, algae will grow, this attracts organisms who whose young eat the algae, that triggers the arrival of the predators and within a few, a few years a food web has emerged and a habitat is established. Patience is the key. It can take a couple of years. My pond was a fetid mess for the first year and it stank. And in the second year, I had um, uh, common emerging from it. So it, it, 
it was, um, yeah, I, it was a good job I didn't clean it out. But you might not be destined to get wagtails and hobbies in your garden like are on this food web, but the midges and mozzies in your pond will attract the dragons and damselflies, which will breed more dragons and damselflies, which will fly off into different areas and become food for something else way down the road or a few miles away. So we can all play our part. Um, we can't make insects do anything they don't want to, but if we think like an insect, things will happen. So that's a little brief illustration of the zones that I've got in my, in my garden. That's what it looked like before on the left. It was a large uh, lawn. Um, I've just created more soil access with terraces and breathing spaces, um, more polyculture in there, just more opportunities and lots of wild zones where we've got brambles and bryony growing and soil, lots of soil. So the insects, um, what's possibly in your garden and outdoor space? Um, here's a selection of insects that you can find in your gardens and outdoor spaces throughout the seasons. I've done it on a seasonal uh, um, basis so that you kind of know when they're going to be around um, and the types of place, place, places they inhabit. So the first one is green shield bug. Um, the brown version is its winter colouring, which is what you'll see in winter. Um, to help it blend in with its more drab brown surroundings. Uh, found in a variety of vegetation, but obviously in the summer it becomes this bright green uh, bug, which again blend, blends in with its surroundings in the summer. Uh, flea beetles are part of the leaf beetle family. Uh, there are lots of species of these and they all fill different niches and you can find them tucked into vegetation and bark in winter, um, but they will become more active in the summer. So you will see them more throughout the year. Um, house flies, different kinds of flies, will um, be found basking in the sun on hedges and fences and buildings on uh, sunny winter days. But again, they're most active throughout the year, and there's quite a few species of those. Uh, you might find caterpillars uh, overwintering in soil, uh, in compost, or in containers. Um, this is, I think, an angle shades caterpillar, quite a common moth. Um, but you, I often do dig them up by accident and have to put them back again. So you might find some of those. Uh, many insects overwinter as larvae or pupae. Uh, and the tree bumblebee. Uh, so you'll see the larger queens on sunny warmer days. They can fly in temperatures as low as five degrees Celsius, especially the, the big buff tail queens. Um, so the winter flowering plants are essential for them. Um, the tree bumblebees will nest in old bird boxes or cavities higher up rather than at ground level. Um, and yeah, so things like Mahonia and winter honeysuckle are really good nectar sources for them in winter. Um, ground beetles, bottom right, can be found under dead wood and in soil. Uh, they're great predators. Um, we'll find them knocking around. They're quite slow in the winter if you lift up a log or a stone. Um, because they're in, in part hibernation mode, but they become very, very fast as soon as it warms up. Um, so as spring approaches, things start to happen. Um, you'll find things like the grey patched mining bee, which nests in loose open soil between flagstones, like you saw the little volcano in my garden. Um, there are quite a few different species of mining bee. Um, some are quite conspicuous, some are quite similar, and they can be quite, a, a, when they get a little bit older and faded in the summer, they can be really difficult to distinguish. Um, so yeah, um, some are easier than others. Um, the damsel bugs, uh, you've got ant damsel bug, tree damsel bug, etc. Um, they can be found in denser vegetation. Uh, they're a bug and they are a highly effective predator. They have a rostrum underneath, a uh, feeding um, sort of needle underneath uh, their faces, which points down towards their abdomen. And that is used for basically impaling small soft bodied invertebrates and sucking the juices out. They are very, very good at um, eating aphids and things. So a great thing to have in your garden. Um, I haven't put too many moths uh, in this presentation because they do generally come out at night and you're not as likely to see them, um, but it gives you a, a good idea of the extraordinary diversity that comes out at night. This is an early grey, quite a hardy one, comes out quite early in the year. 
Um, the larvae feed on wild and cultivated honeysuckles. So if you've got those in your garden, that's a great uh, nectar source for them. Uh, you'll find them, probably see them quite early on if you've got a moth trap or if you have a night wander with a torch. Uh, the buff tail queen, um, that needs early nectar sources as well. That's the massive flying tank that you'll see uh, as early as February, sometimes in deep winter as well. Uh, you get out of the way when she comes towards you, not because she's going to hurt you, but just because she is so damn big. They are amazing. Uh, I just love big insects because so most of them are very small, so it's always good to see a big one. Uh, she'll nest in cavities at ground level um, under your shed uh, or in your garage, as you've seen. And the brimstone, and that's one of our earliest flat flying butterflies, uh, really hardy, amazing for such a delicate little creature. Um, it's got this beautiful acid green yellow wing, which is very leaf shaped. And when it's folded up and in dappled sunlight, you just cannot see it against those spring leaves. Um, the larvae feed on buckthorn leaves. Um, so you might not have buckthorn uh, in your garden, but you might have buckthorn near your garden um, and you'll see the adults very strong flyers, really fast flyers, and they will patrol up and down looking for nectar and mates. Uh, a special mention has to go to one of my favourites, the hairy-footed flower bee. Uh, they are the starting gun of spring, and once you see those, you know that there's no going back. They're out, everything else is coming. Um, they are sexually dimorphic, meaning that the male and the female are very different. They, um, the female is this uh, black, jet black uh, little bee, often confused for a uh, smaller bumblebee, but she has uh, a black body and the uh, hind femora are that ginger color, often co covered up by pollen. So you have to have a good look for that. Um, but she's got a little bit of a white face as well and that, that lovely thick tongue, which she pushes into long work and other suitable plants. Um, and the male, is quite spectacular. He's got this white face, very gingery uh, body, and those incredible flares, if you can see on the front legs there, he's got these wispy fringes, tassels off his, off his legs, which is very distinctive. And if you see that, you know it's a hairy-footed flower bee. Um, the females nest in larger holes and crevices in wooden masonry. Um, they're quite choosy. They like lung work, pulmonaria. Uh, primrose and grape hyacinths and a couple of other plants. I think that one, that male might be on a spurge, but they are quite choosy in what they eat. Um, so as spring goes on, we get lots of other species um, coming out, like the dark-edged bee fly, which is another one of my favourites. It's a parasitoid of mining bees and uh, it has a, an interesting um, way of doing this. Um, it coats its eggs in, in fine sand and soil, which it does basically by twerking its bum in the, in the soil to pick up um, the very fine sand, which acts as a sort of ballast and camouflage for the eggs. It will then hover over the entrance of the nest and literally flick the eggs towards the nest entrance. And then those lucky larvae who hatch and make it into the um, solitary bee nests are rewarded with basically an all-you-can-eat buffet of bee eggs and larvae and other pollen and provisions will eat the lot. Um, so yeah, they are pretty gruesome, but also amazing. Really love those things. Uh, speaking of mining bees, you've got the tawny mining bee, which is really distinctive. It's one of the brightest and um, most easy to identify. We've got that bright shining orange thorax and abdomen, those black head and legs. Uh, and it's one of many bees, uh, mining bee species that will nest in that firm but open soil, they'll dig nest chambers. They're not social bees, but you will often see several mining bees in the same place. They've basically all found the, the same place that they like and they'll form aggregations. So they're not working together, they're just side by side. Um, the common wasp queen again, but she's not at all like her crotchety, sugar starved end of summer workers. Um, the common wasp queens are gentle giants. They really are. They're too busy foraging and finding a nest site to bother with humans. If you have a large garden and can share your space with the colony, that's brilliant. But in smaller spaces, they can be a little problematic just in case in, because the workers, workers can be quite aggressive or just so defensive. They're not aggressive, they're defensive. Um, they'll only come at you if they think you're going to hurt them. Or they can really hurt you back. Um, if you do see the beginnings of a wasp nest and it is in a problematic area, it's best to remove it while it's very small um, in the absence of the queen before it gets too big. 
um, become a butterfly. This is another butterfly that makes an, uh, an early appearance um, and its uh, larval food plant is mainly nettles, um, but not exclusively, which is why wild zones in gardens are really valuable. And this little um, bottom left, this little creature is a devil's coach horse uh, larvae and beetle larvae look a lot like, can look a lot like caterpillars, but you can see the shape of the head and they move a lot faster and that will be under logs and stones. Um, the drone fly, he's a large hoverfly, very distinctive. Um, it's got a, um, it's a honeybee mimic, um, can look a lot like it when it's on flowers, but it's got that one pair of wings and the halters, which is a good ID um, key. The larvae are aquatic. Uh, they're not fussy, fussy about water quality. The yuckier, the better. Um, the larvae eat the detritus and rotting matters so that they're essential recyclers, so don't clean your pond too much. Uh, marmalade hoverfly, um, this can be seen uh, as soon as it starts to warm up. It is the gardener's friend. The, the larvae are amazing um, uh, predators of aphids and other small invertebrates. Um, they will overwinter in the UK, but they do have an amazing migratory pattern as well. Hundreds of thousands of them will fly the length of Europe over here, even coming over the Alps um, to come for the summer. So they, they are an amazing creature. Uh, and the muslin moth, another one that you might not see, but it's worth going to a community moth trapping or something just to see this guy. It's the Mark Bolin of the moth world, that uh, amazing fur, those antennae and the smudge mascara markings on its eyes. It's so worth finding, it's brilliant. Uh, and red mason bees, that's another distinctive bee that comes out in spring. Um, it doesn't nest in soil, it nests in wooden masonry and it's probably the most common inhabitant of bee hotels. The females have the little horns, the projections on the front of her face, um, which she uses to uh, dig out, excavate wet mud that she'll take back to her nest cells and line the nest cells and seal them up with it. Um, if you've got a pond, you may well have damselfly larvae in there. Uh, the damselfly larvae can spend up to two years at the bottom of ponds, chomping their way through lots of small aquatic invertebrates. Um, and they will uh, inhabit quite small ponds. Mine's only a metre by an, uh, a metre and a half. It's not very big at all and they're in there. And then the little guy at the bottom left is the forget-me-not shield bug. So if you've got forget-me-nots, you may see the shield bug, but you'll have to grub around at the bottom of the forget-me-nots because they do tend to sit at the bottom on the ground level. Um, so moving into summer, uh, the ants will start to come out. Uh, they'll make an appearance. Uh, they'll uh, make little patrols into your house to see if there's any food, but they're usually gone within a couple of weeks unless um, they've hit the jackpot. Uh, the crane flies uh, or the daddy long legs, not the spiders. They're, they're, their larvae live in open soil um, in lawns, sometimes emerging on mass, and they will overposit, like you can see in the picture, top center, sort of sitting down, looking like they're doing a poo, uh, but that's actually um, laying eggs. So you may see them in, uh, on your lawn. Uh, my mum's nemesis, top right, is the lily beetle. Um, if you've got lilies, fritillary, snakes head fritillary, you will probably see them eventually. They are very distinctive. Um, they're out and about now. Uh, they've got that red upper side, quite shiny, and the black head and legs. Um, the uh, mint moth, bottom centre, uh, is a day flying moth, so you will see that and you'll see it around cat mints and quite a lot of different herbs. Um, it's a very distinctive little moth, only about a centimetre across, but they're really beautiful. Uh, the yellow meadow ants will colonise your lawn and if you don't cut your lawn, and I love this, not many people like this, but I love this, I love leaving a bit of lawn un uncut all summer and letting them um, create their little mounds as they displace the soil. So the, the soil raises up and you get this little hump and they're fantastic. Uh, and then you've got the 22 spot ladybird, which is about half the size of a seven spot, bright yellow. It is a mildew eater, feeder, um, not a carnivore, uh, but you'll find those in dense vegetation if you look closely, but you'll have to look closely because they're tiny. Um, so um, summer, gets underway and the Narcissus hoverfly will make an appearance and that's got a really loud um, high-pitched menacing buzz so you can kind of distinct, uh, distinguish those when they're flying. You'll often see them mating, uh, they tend to do that a lot and in uh, plain sight um, so that's another furry hoverfly, a little bit like a bumblebee mimic. Um, cockchafers, if you're lucky you'll see cockchafers, there are many of them about, um, they're quite common but 
you don't I don't see many of them whereas people a few miles away see loads of them um they're not they're sort of dusk flyers and they'll hit the kitchen window with a thud if you've left the light on um they're widespread but localized um but yeah you if you've got a moth trap you're likely to collect a few overnight um the lesser stag beetle uh, one of my favourite beetles. It's less flashy than the big stag beetle, but it's superb. Um, it, its larvae need broadleaf dead wood um, in which it lives. They will live and chomp away on the wood for a couple of years and then it pupates and then sometimes spends another year in the wood as an adult and then it will emerge and they can emerge in, qu in quite good numbers when they come out. It's smaller. It's uh, less than an inch long um, uh, than the uh, smaller than the big stag beetle and it's a bit more textured and it's black rather than chestnut colored and the males don't have the big the big antlers. Uh, the back swimmers, uh, these are amphibious uh, bugs and some can, some can fly some distance to find water to reproduce in. Um, any kind of pond will suffice. Uh, they're predators of aquatic fly larvae and they sometimes mistake your car for the surface of water when they're flying and will hit, hit it with a, and bounce off. So I've had to rescue them before when they've um, been bouncing around on the drive. Um, that's the uh, solitary wasp bottom centre that uh, like to uh, that I showed you earlier that um, nests in plant stem cavities, often bramble or masonry or any suitable nook and cranny. Uh, it preys on the micro moth larvae. It needs a good supply of them to um, to raise its young. They are also great biological control, as are the ladybird larvae bottom left. Um, some, another fabulous predator. They require a good stock of aphids, and I'm sure a lot of you gardeners have got good stocks of aphids for them to feed on. Um, so the sawflies are quite underrepresented in this presentation, I'm afraid. They're not flies, they are part of the hymenoptera, the ants, bees and wasps. Uh, they're a precursor to those, um, those um, groups of animals. Uh, groups of insects. They look like wasps, but they are chunky. They've got a tubular abdomen, whereas wasps have a very thin waist um, and their ovipositors haven't evolved into stings, but they're quite diverse. They come in a big range of colours and sizes. Um, the speckled, speckled bush cricket top centre um, is a fantastic little bush cricket. It's one of the common garden orthopterans. It can jump, but it's flightless. It has very reduced wings and the nymphs like all um, young orthopterans have no wings at all. Uh, you'll find it usually higher up at, at shrub level, uh, at eye level, rather than down in the in the at soil level or in or in the in the lawn. Um, the this little butterfly top right is a small skipper, but it could be an Essex skipper. They are really difficult to tell apart in certain from certain angles. Um, but these are small butterflies that their wings are folded in a, in a really unusual way. It looks like an X shape from the back, like a little X wing fighter. Uh, their habitat is generally longer meadow grass with plenty of wild flowers like knapweed and scabious. Uh, the Willoughby's leafcutter bee, uh, which is bottom right, um, that's one of the uh, bees that comes out usually after the mason and mining bees, but I have seen a few early ones this year. Um, they use leaves such as lilac and honeysuckle, rose, willow, and they, uh, you saw in the video earlier, they have the, cut out those little circles and they take them back to line there. Um, like their nest cells, which look nice and green and lush. This is a male and the uh, tarsi, there's a little sort of flat modification to its front leg, which is uh, particular to um, a couple of species of the leafcutter bee, just in the males, but not in the females. So if you see that, you know, you've got a leafcutter. Oh, do you know, I think I might have skipped a couple there. Did I, say, can I go back? There we go. Um, the burnished brass moth is a really stunning moth. Uh, moth. It looks like a brass beer pump. It is so shiny. It's incredible. If you can see that, yeah, get, get out there, get your moth trap out if you've got one, or get your sheet up on the fence and shine a torch just to see if you can see one. They are incredible. Um, and the um, parasitoid wasps come in all shapes and sizes. They're not just the yellow and black ones that scare you away from your. Uh, from your beer in the beer garden. There's also, um, over 7,000 wasp species and counting, most of which are parasitoid. Now this has a very fearsome looking ovipositor on the back, which is not a sting. It uses it as a probe to probe down into um, nest, uh, solitary bee and wasp 
nest tunnel to lay its eggs, which hatch into larvae, which then feast on whatever's in the nest. I love parasitoid wasps, they're fantastic. Um, the black horned gem um, is a soldier fly. Um, it's a family of very striking flies, uh, some of which are common in gardens. This one is a shiny metallic green and blue color, the black horned gem. Uh, and it's in the male, its head literally is its eyes, like massive beach balls, huge. Uh, these will be found in shrubs and trees, uh, in woodland and gardens, and the larvae developing compost heaps and grass cutting piles. Uh, the next one, the vine weevil, this polarizes people, especially gardeners. They don't like it, but I think it's lovely. And I it's native. I used to think it was an invasive species, but it's not, it's a native species. Um, they breed prodigiously, and that's down to them being parthenogenetic, which means that they, um, the adults are all female, and they basically give birth to clones like aphids do. So females give birth to females, and then they churn out more females, which is why they're quite successful. Uh, and the wool carder bee, uh, top right, is this large and distinctive bee that we saw earlier. It's very unusual for a bee. Um, in that the male is larger than the female and it's highly proactive, to be pleased to know. Uh, it doesn't sit around nectaring and lecking. It, it finds the food plant of the female, which is the stachys, and it guards it fiercely, attacking anything else that will approach it and jabbing it with those spines on the back of its abdomen uh, and trying to crush them and often killing them. It's really aggressive. Once a female has accepted him, he will give her full access to the stachys leaves, which she'll shave off, hence the name Carder bee, and then take back to her nest and use, use it to line her nest cells um, that are in crevices and plant stem tubes. So that is a beast of a bee. Uh, the cinnamon bug is really distinctive. It's a lovely little ropely bug, which doesn't smell unlike some bugs, which have defensive scent glands. Um, it's quite, it's like a couple of other species, but they are quite rare, so you're unlikely to mistake it if it's just in your garden. It's quite distinctive. Uh, and the privet hawk moth is one of our largest insects. The hawk moths are spectacular, quite large. Um, you might not see them very often, but they are fairly common, but you're more likely to see the big, chunky uh, caterpillars and pupae um, at various times of years. But I would see that, and I just think, I can't believe that's not from the tropics. It's incredible. Um, the green lacewing is one of our more underrated insects in our gardens. Uh, it's a little bit of flim flam when it's flying around, but it's a close up. It's just beautiful. It's got those gem like eyes and those cut glass wings. It's very, very beautiful. The larvae are a different matter. They are one of our most ferocious predators. Um, they look like little caterpillars that have long pincers coming out the front of their faces that grab and chew down on small soft bodied invertebrates like aphids, etc. Um, and they will also adorn themselves with the remains of their prey in some sort of grotesque fancy dress, probably as a masking device to improve their hunting prospects. Um, the holly blue butterfly top left, um, a tiny blue butterfly that often nectars higher up in the canopy of uh, garden trees. Um, the larvae feed on shrubs and small trees, etc. Um, for example, sorry, holly and ivy. Um, their underside is distinctive. They have those small uh, black freckles as opposed to the chunkier markings of the common blue and other blue butterflies. Um, it usually sits with its uh, wings closed at rest. Um, the hornet hoverfly is one of my favourite hoverflies and the largest in the UK. Um, it does dwarf most of the hoverflies and other flies, to be honest. Um, it's a mimic. It lays its eggs around the base of hornet nests where its larvae feed on the detritus left by the uh, larvae and the um, workers. Uh, looking like a hornet does help with the subterfuge and they also have apparently UV visible markings um, that are visible under UV light, which makes sense uh, that these markings do look like the um, uh, wasp markings as well. And that makes sense because insects do see on the UV spectrum. Uh, the great pied hoverfly is another distinctive hoverfly, which has a similar ecology to the um, hornet hoverfly that's black and white. Um, the Batman hoverfly, top right, it's a really zingy, lemony, fuzzy um, hoverfly. And it's called a Batman hoverfly because it has that little marking on its, um, uh, on its, the back of its thorax and its pronotum, which is 
sometimes doesn't, but sometimes does look like the bat signal that's shown into the sky in films and comics. Um, the larvae need damp deadwood or stumps where rot holes fill with water and get a bit gunky. That's what their larvae really like. Um, if you've got long grass, you may have grasshoppers like this meadow grasshopper. Um, they like undisturbed longer grass areas. Um, so if you've got that, they may well move in. And then the chunk bottom center is the thick legged flower beetle. Uh, this is a male. The males are generally being down the gym. Um, it's a bright metallic green beetle. Uh, it loves open flowers such as buttercups and brambles and umbellifers. Um, the bigger the quads in the male, the more likely they are to impress females. Um, and you can tell um, this from other similar species by the way the elytra, the wing cases taper and have a split down the middle. So you can just about see the wings, which distinguishes it from uh, some other similar species. Um, thistles are a popular larval plant. Um, they develop in the plant stems. So the year's nearly over and moving into autumn, we've got a few insects that will persist into the colder, uh, into sort of the later, slightly cooler months. Uh, the common furrow bee is out for most of the year, but it does persist into autumn. It's a uh, small bee that looks like a solitary bee, but it's actually eusocial. Um, females will often congregate and one will become dominant and assume position of the queen and then the others will become her workers or a female will just raise several workers who will take over foraging duties. Um, they nest in short turf or grass to create nest tunnels. So if you've got some short grass, that's actually, that works to their benefit. Uh, throughout the summer and autumn, you'll see grass bugs, such as this Stenodema species, uh, top centre. Uh, they're long and slender. Grass bugs don't have the little ocelli, the little um, light photoreceptor eyes, not the main eyes, it's the little ones on top of the head that many other insects have. So you can tell they're grass bugs. Uh, and the larvae develop in grass stems and eat unripe grass seeds. Um, hoverfly larvae, those little snot-like looking things, if you've got those, you're onto a winner because they are the really good um, predators of a small pest invertebrates, inverted commas. Um, so if you've got those on your on the underside of your leaves um, in the autumn, then that's fab. Good for you. Um, they might be marmalade hoverfly larvae, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, the ground beetle that's got the, the larger insect, insect picture is uh, Leicester spinibarbis. I don't think there's a common name for it, but it's an amazing apex predator in its microhabitat. It's really fast, it's bright metallic blue with those red legs. It's really unmissable when you see it in the sunshine. And the best thing about it is that little basket, that prey basket that it's got underneath its mouth parts, which snare, like trap small uh, invertebrates in, in a massive death kiss. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And lastly, uh, the ivy bee, which we discussed uh, briefly earlier, uh, it's a harbinger, harbinger of winter. It's the last and latest, uh, be to emerge in the year. Uh, they feed on um, ivy almost exclusively, but I think they might be diversifying a little bit. Uh, and they nest in um, very sandy open soil and make these huge aggregations, a bit like the bee wolves do. So just a quick word on mimicry. We're nearly at the end. Um, lots of species in your garden may look quite similar. Um, vulnerable species evolve the colours and patterns of poisonous or more aggressive species to avoid being eaten or to gain access to nests. Um, so if you see uh, some of these similar looking species, that's why. So at the top left, you've got the surface um, species of a fly, which is quite wasp-like. Uh, top uh, top centre is the common wasp, the one that they all want to try and look like. Uh, top right, Xanthogramma pedisequum is a... Uh, hoverfly which almost does have the, the wasp waist, it's quite narrow waisted which is quite a good mimicry. The Batman hoverfly again at the bottom right, um, the wasp plume horn Volucella, uh, or Volucella inanis bottom centre which is a lot like the hornet hoverfly but slightly different, got narrower uh, bands on it and then a completely different animal, uh, a wasp beetle Clytus arietus which is a longhorn beetle which you may find in your garden but it likes to um, nest in um, old timbers as longhorns do. So that is the insect year. So just to summarize, um, sorry, I know we've overrun a little bit. Um, 
gardens and outdoor spaces have the potential to support huge numbers of insects which cumulatively can help to link up wildlife corridors throughout the country indeed the continent and the world um, insects can be found throughout the year in gardens and make just as much use of them in winter we just don't see them as readily and um, the key to creating a supportive habitat is polyculture zoning soil and patience uh, all of the uh, all insects are, in, are interconnected in some way through habitats and further connected to other animal groups through predator prey or parasitic relationships and climate change could be driving where insects live throughout the country over the coming years and decades and finally insects are amazing um, there are some links and resources here um, if you want to find out more if you've got the insect bug um, the Tenipsera YouTube page is a brilliant resource and I'm so honoured to um, be among these people, these experts who are just incredible people in their field and know so much about uh, our different insects in the country. Um, <clears throat> Tristan Bantock's uh, British Bugs website and Stephen Falk's Flickr site are brilliant uh, visual resources for identification as well. Um, you've got the Bee Wars uh, Bug Life website, PTES, which is great for the stag beetles and, and, and other, other beetles. And if you fancy joining a society, uh, join the An Amateur Entomologi Entomologist Society, uh, which is a great uh, society. I've just joined and their president is Beulah Garner at the moment, who is the most wonderful human being and a carabid uh, ground beetle expert. So have a look at that. And you can help to record observations uh, by going to the iRecord website or getting the app where you can help to monitor species. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about how to improve your habitats, um, the, here are a few books that can help you. Um, Kate Bradbury is a great resource on turning a small urban garden space into supportive habitat. Her book on wildlife ponds, and there, she has another book as well, um, are really good resources. And Jean Vernon's new book is fantastic, Attracting Garden Pollinators. It's a real go-to for advice on plants and flowers that provide strong long-term support for garden pollinators. It's a really good book. And uh, if you want to know what the insects are in your garden, you could get mine and Dominic's new book to help you identify visitors uh, you accumulate as your habitats establish. Um, thank you for being here. Thanks for listening. Um, I'll hand you back to um, Gary. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, that was absolutely superb. Um, I just, you know, I, I, I'm just reminded really of, of, of this of immediately of the, of the scale of gardens, you know, approximately 23 million. And, and, and you really remind me of just how many species and distinctive species as well that you know everybody can learn that, that you find in your garden um i know your book's gonna feature 150 or something like that isn't it yeah so, you know and, and yeah it's just I, I can't believe something like that hasn't come out before actually but that's <laughs> but but anyway I, I i think um yeah just just the the number of sort of tips and backed up by the by the principles you you've given uh, uh, should really inspire people to to look more in their garden and and try and improve it really and just you well you've just demonstrated really how you can get a number of species by you know whatever size garden you've got you can there's lots of ways to attract them and um yeah i just yeah, yeah really appreciate you doing i it. think that's that's a really important point is that we can all play our part no matter how big or small our garden is if we've just got a bucket on a balcony i just think everybody yeah should be encouraged and should feel that they can make a difference absolutely thank you and i i think so now we're gonna going to have about a bit of a question and answer and 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 Dominic's here as well um Hello, co author uh, of, the, of the book to to help <laughs> as I understand as I understand great so we yeah, so we've had any help <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've 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 had a few questions um in the chat as it's gone along so I'm just gonna start with the top one of those so from Carol Driver um what's the best thing to do with ants in a raised bed that's used for growing vegetables <laughs> i'm i'm an insect lover i'd just say leave them but that's not the answer you want is it <laughs> um 
I'm I'm not a horticultural expert. That's that's um that's probably a, a, a question for a, a, an horticultural person. Um, as I said earlier, if, if I've got yellow meadow ants in my garden, I'm likely to leave them and let them wreck the lawn. So I don't really know what to suggest, I'm afraid. As the insect lover, I'd be, I'd be too busy photographing them. I don't know, has anybody else got any suggestions? Anyone else like to unmute? Well, you know, this, this, is, a, this is a pro insect. <laughs> Webinar, not pro vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you like vegetables as well, though. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we'll 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 move on to another question, but people can uh, yeah, you can very much try and answer that if you like in the chat. If you've got any particular tips, mm -hmm. um, so one from Jessica Stewart. Um, would it be good for the insects to plant poppies on a tree stump? Oh, I'd like to know a little bit more about the context of that tree stump. Um, any wildflowers in your garden are going to support um, various species. Um, but if it's, if it's a tree stump, the thing that's just popping to mind now is to dig a bit of a hole in it, fill it with water, or let it get all rotten and let lots of different hoverflies and things um, occupy it. I think that the flowers would probably be better off in containers or soil substrate. Um, the other great thing about um, tree stumps is you'll get fungi growing on them. And depending on what species of tree it is, that will depend on, the, you'll get some more generalist fungi and then you might get some specialized fungi. And if you've got things like uh, King Alfred's cakes, the uh, the little um, hardened uh, ball fungi, the brown, you can get some fantastic um, weevils in those, the, the, fun the fungus weevils. So I would say probably put your poppies somewhere else and and let that let that tree stump gradually uh, melt back into nature and see what happens. Yeah, I I would totally agree. You could plant a poppy anywhere, couldn't you? But it's probably mm -hmm. a, a a, a less common situation to be able to flood a tree stump mm. with, with water and and let that let the f fungi thrive. I absolutely love King Alfred's cakes because there is a there is a number of uh, different saprocyclic beetles on them. It's yeah, they as soon as I see them, I, I try and see what's what's crawling around. There are some amazing beetles associated with fungi, aren't they? Like the um, the Prispoletti, uh, they're just fantastic. Yeah. And I, and I don't know now, just going off topic a little bit, because Ash dieback, because obviously you get you get the Alfred's cakes on on ash, and I wonder if there's just a lot more of it at the moment because of because the ash is ash is struggling everywhere. So I don't know, but I'm I'm, yeah. I'm just noticing it a lot at the moment and uh, enjoying finding the Beatles on it anyway. Mm. Um, okay. Um, so this is a question from, and I'm sorry for the pronunciation, Wendika Lim, can I send photos to you for ID? Where to get help for ID? Thanks. I'm, I'm not sure, Wendika, if you're in the United Kingdom, and I think someone wrote in the chat about putting images on iSpot Nature. Um, but yeah, there's uh, yeah. So it, it, it probably depend on a number of things in terms of the best place to be um, putting your your images for ID, depending on what country yeah. you're in. I'm I'm certainly more able to ID UK based species, and I'm more than happy for people to get in touch via Twitter. If you want to um, just tag me in your photos, uh, and I'll have a have a go IDing them. Um, but yeah, absolutely. But um, if um, if your viewer wants to uh, just have another look at through the recording at the slide, there's a number of ID uh, resources that I, I put on that are so helpful and they've been amazing for me. They've really taught me a lot as well. Great. I hope that can help you out, Wendika. Um, OK, question from Richard Payne, too. Um, home Park near Hampton Court has a great range of tawny mining bee nests in a network of bare soil paths. One year, the Royal Parks covered the lot with stone chippings. 
Would the bees have survived that? It depends. It depends on the depth, I suppose, and the size of the stone chippings uh, and how compacted it was. It probably wouldn't have done them much good, that's for sure. Um, what do you think, Dominic? Hi, yeah, it does. It sounds like a, um, a bit of a disaster, to be honest. Uh, those yeah. mining bees are pretty small and they can't sort of move uh, stones around, can they? So it might yeah. have been a bit of a boo-boo, to be honest. It's it's really um, it's it's interesting because there, there are some larger um, organisations and trustees of large amounts of land that don't often make good decisions, um, and it's really hard to watch those poor decisions being made. They're, they're thinking they're not really thinking about the bigger picture. Of, it would just take somebody to go and say, "Oh, there's something nesting in here. Maybe we should." Be a little bit more sympathetic um yeah in my local forest uh, a couple few years ago um there was a beautiful bit of woodland that had just got really overgrown and they raised they scrubbed the whole lot and it was devastating because um i'd found with a with an associate found nationally scarce beetles in there and it just yeah as a as a lover of all wildlife it, it's really hard to see that a lot of people do see what's happening to the larger mammals and reptiles, but it's happening on such a small scale as well. And we can't afford to lose those really important habitats. It's about education, isn't it? Mm. Uh, which is partly why we wrote the book, um, to, mm. to make people more aware of insects. And the more they're aware of insects, hopefully those sorts of things will happen less often. I think it, it's happening as well. There are a lot more people who care about invertebrates now. So hopefully <laughs> that won't happen quite so much in the future. Hmm. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, and sorry to hear that, Richard, but um, just hope that, uh, that they, can, they will have survived. Um, okay, well, we'll take a question. If anyone wanted to just speak a question, some people prefer that to writing in the chat. Does anyone want have a particular burning question they'd like to unmute themselves? Oh, well, we've got Poran's iPad. Hi, Poran. thank you very thank you very much for being, I'm so glad I've joined this presentation. Thank you for organizing it. However, I got it, I'm really grateful I was on there to hear. One, the question I have is, actually I have two questions, I hope I'm allowed. Um, one is going back to the ants, except my ants I want to keep, but they're in a, um, last year's tomato bag um the compost and the ants have moved in but i don't know whether to just leave them in the greenhouse or whether to move them outside that's my question so i, I don't really worry about the vegetables or anything i want to keep the ants but i don't know what's the right thing to do and the other one is you said something about the stick i do keep trays of water and i do put pebbles in it so that small invertebrates can get to the water but i don't know about the stick so is that just did you mention that or did I mishear heard you when you said put a little stick in the water tub or was it water in the wooden pile? I'm not sure I got this right. Um, well, th first of all, thank you so much for um, uh, looking after your ants. Uh, I'll come back to that one in a minute. Um, I can't remember mentioning sticks, but if you've got any, any um, water sources, washing up bowl or a big pond, Putting sticks in them to allow um, things to perch near the water is really, really useful. Um, stones and pebbles in water help create different levels within the water, and that's good for different types of invertebrates. Um, so, yeah, um, I, think you, I think you definitely came up with the idea of sticks there, and it's a great one. So, yeah, sticks, wood, anything. Also, if you've got water, um, you need to just make sure that any larger animals can get out if they fall in. Um, so that's why sort of um, larger sticks at an angle coming out of the pond um, up to the edge can just help if, if any um, slightly larger animals were to fall in. Um, does that answer your, does that answer the stick question? For Definitely, a thank you, that's good. Uh, getting it at an angle, uh, that's you, brilliant. Did you have anything to add to that, Dominic? Uh, no, not really, I was going to say what you, were, what you just said about sticks. Um, and also about the, the sides of ponds need to be um, 
uh, they don't want to be too steep because insect can fall into them. So that's just a general point on, on ponds. You need a shallow end, so to speak. Although you want to feed your pond skaters as well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is amazing how many animals will move into your garden just by putting a small pond in there. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Isn't it? Um, going back to the, the ants in the bag. Um, yeah, if you, do you know what? If you want to move them out of your greenhouse, if um, thank you so much for sharing your compost with them. I really, that's brilliant. Um, move them into any other corner behind a shed or just a quiet corner where you can leave them to it and they can leave you to it. And they might move out within a few years. Uh, they might decide to stay there. It depends. But yeah, if you want them out of the way, certainly move them out of the greenhouse because they'll be happy within that colony and they, they will find their way. They will come out of the bag to go and find food, but they'll start to find their way. They'll reorientate themselves um, as long as they've got their babies with them. They'll be absolutely fine. Thank you very much indeed again. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Great. Yeah, I... <clears throat> I remember just a few weeks ago telling my dad off for the pond that he was a bit of a death trap really for insects because um, it just had steep sides all the, all the way around. And, it, and if you don't fill it up as well, some, some people, you know, they like to keep water outside and only, only fill it up with rainwater. Even if you've got a, a, a sloped side, sometimes it's only sloped at the top. So you've got to, you, 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 you pick up it's, it's like a giant pitfall trap isn't it so you can yeah uh, you've got to be careful around that when you're building a, a new pond yeah I did see an amazing thing a couple of years ago I fell foul of that and I did um I did check my pond um, one day and found a mouse that died in it but I looked back I left it in there I thought well you know we'll see what happens and a couple of days later the um the near the sub adult tadpoles were feasting on it it was really gruesome but in a way i thought oh, everything's got to eat something hasn't it yeah well um okay uh i'll go to a question now from josmac i've just started using the iNaturalist app is that the same as record or do you mean perhaps you mean i record Yes, must mean I record. So, um, would, would you like to answer that, Gail? Um, yeah, well, as you probably yeah. know, um, they are different websites. I use iRecord. Um, iNaturalist is more of a forum, isn't it? Um, where you can sort of share your photos and then people can tell you what they think and leave comments and stuff. Whereas, um, did I get that right? iNaturalist is, is the forum, whereas iRecord is something that you just upload and say, I found this on this day, um, send a photo, and then it gets verified. Um, is, that, is that what you make of it? Um, I think uh, iNaturalist is um, a more global mm -hmm. website, and, and it, is a, it, is a, it is a serious recording platform with, it, with a, 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 I think, a slightly different... A uh, way of it's it's more peer, a bit like I spot where you have different, you have everyone can sort of wade in with different expertise and and make identifications on it. Um, in since October though, since October last year, any anything that is any records that go on to iNaturalist do do come through to iRecord, which are then they're then re verified by I suppose approved verifiers that that the creators of I record the CH will will govern with the, with the recording schemes um, so you so you get real experts only expert verification on, on I record um, I, I think they both have have their merits and and lots of people prefer I naturalist and uh, I'm very happy now that all those records from my naturalist also come through to to i record so that's really um, good news yeah so i i think you could um uh jaws mac you could um yeah i don't think it matters whichever is is works better for you then um you know hopefully your records will go to the, the right places and be really useful yeah definitely um, 
Okay, I'll go to a question from Claire S. Are there opportunities in the garden, e.g. absence of deer slash dogs, etc., that might shape how we choose to manage them? Lack of deer in the garden. That, that's an, is, it, did I hear that right? That's an impressive garden. Uh, I, 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 is it asking that because the, you won't get deer or dogs in the garden, does that give you an opportunity to do something else or um, something differently? It's, well, it certainly means that there's, there isn't a, a random um, rogue predator in the shape of a dog or something eating all your vegetation as as deer do they're the prolific browsers aren't they of young trees um, I'm not sure on a small garden basis it makes a huge amount of difference although if you don't have dogs you're more likely to probably get um inver invertebrates you might even be lucky to get things like slow worms and lizards that would naturally pique the attention of dogs um, on a, on a larger garden basis where you you are backing onto sort of fields and woodlands um then there, there might be a, a little bit more of a case at um i kind of dream of deer walking through my garden <laughs> that would be incredible <laughs> yeah it would it would inevitably change the landscape a little bit you would get you deer do uh, cause quite a lot of vegetation damage don't they so um probably more than aphids so you'd have a whole different set of issues <laughs> yeah i think if, if, if you if it was just the 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 occasional deer which would be lovely then you might even increase a bit of your vegetation structure mm. in there if it was mm. only was it was only uh, you know had the courage to go to certain bits of your garden which are a bit more you must have a you must have a big garden probably to to attract a, a deer in there but yeah wow um, and of course deer deer dung is very is great for mm -hmm. you yeah. they, they carry their own insects with them so you'd get that extra um fauna wouldn't you yeah absolutely um okay um jan kit would you like to unmute and say your question um yeah i'd like I was impressed with the bee bank, and I wondered. Um, I'm two minutes uh, kind of south, south facing, southish facing bee bank, and I was wondering about the, the was it sand what you put in? And if so, what kind of sand was it? Wash sand or or sand, um, um, builder's sand which has salt in it. Um, so I, I honestly can't remember what sand I put in. Um, it is more likely to have been a, a builder sand and probably when I made that bee bank, be, being a bit of a novice and not at all having any building skills, it may have had salt in it. All I can say is um, it can't have been that salty because the plant species have thrived in there although it is thrift and that is a coastal species, so who knows. But basically what I did um, was I mixed um, probably around half of each uh, towards the base of my clay soil and sand, and I've mixed in some looser compost as well just to loosen up the clay a little bit uh, and dump that in. But then that top couple of inches is probably predominantly sand. Um, because at that point I probably underestimated how much um, soil I needed and how much extra. So it probably would have been a greater degree of sand, a percentage of sand. Um, so yeah, no, do you know, it's funny you said about the salt because I suddenly thought, oh, I don't know, Ooh, uh, I'm not sure. But um, that it has attracted bee species. Uh, there's lots of invertebrates, other invertebrates in there. And the fact that, um, there uh, are plant species, there's herb species growing in there. I think, I think, I think the balance is okay, but you've you've actually made me check myself and think maybe next time I'll check exactly which sand I'm using. It's a good point. Okay, thank you, thank you. I I hadn't thought of salt in, in builder sand. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, okay, the next question um, from the chat is from CL. 
And I think it's a question for me. So does the TNIPTRA project offer support for doing invertebrate surveys? Um, so this, yeah, I, uh, I'm not quite sure uh, what you mean exactly, CL. Um, if, if you are it, it, within North West England, as in the Lancashire and Cheshire, um, Greater Manchester, Merseyside region, um, then you and and you and you want to do a survey um, as a, as a sort of a volunt as, as a voluntary um, study, then we have a we have a small grant scheme which you could apply to for up to seven hundred and fifty pounds um, to support the costs of. Uh, of equipment, of accommodation, of your travel. Um, but this is normally surveys of really under-recorded invertebrates. So let's say you want to do a study of springtails in, in, a, in, a, in a few different ancient woodland patches or something. It will be a bit more like that. So we, so we don't sort of um, support uh give money for commercial surveys or to pay to pay salaries of uh um yeah commercial entomologist um professional surveys this is to, to support amateur recording of sites um so you could have a look at, at the more sort of um detailed criteria on our website for that that's one way i suppose you could you could say we do lots of workshops so we're supporting your knowledge in order to be able to identify things during surveys um we we don't normally we get lots of requests for people for, for us to come out with other museum staff and volunteers to come and do surveys of particular places for various reasons we normally say no to that because we 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 are we are there are so many sites that, that are under recorded and important sites within the region. Um, and we, as, as, a, as a project, we like to choose on merit as not, we're not in reactive in that way or just come to a site because someone would like us to because there are hundreds of different sites that we could do. Um, but you could try us and, and see, explain exactly what you're, you're meaning, but it would, so, so we, so in in a way we do support invertebrate surveys, but uh, okay, I'll I'll, um, I'll have a read of of what you've written in the chat because I've just seen something pop up, and I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps I'll reply to you directly rather than um, carrying on right now. Okay, if that's okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. We'll go to a question now. Um, from Jonathan Davies, if you, you've got your hand up. So if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> Would you like to suggest what the five must have plant species uh, are in your garden uh, to encourage insect life? I can, oh, five. I'm looking at Jean's book now and thinking, well, what would Jean say? I would, my immediate one would be winter honeysuckle. Um, I just find that winter honeysuckle is a really good thick grower. It's got good vegetation in the summer, but through the coldest months right into early spring, it's got these incredible scented flowers on it. Um, and there's so many of them. It's so densely um, flowered that it just it's a fantastic support for any um, early bumbles, any early flies, hoverflies, uh, anything that comes in close to it, it just gets snared in this beautiful scent. So definitely winter honeysuckle. Um, pulmonaria lungwort, the one that the hairy footed flower bees um, love, that's another spring one. Um, the uh, bee flies love it as well. It's just, it comes out just at the right time um, for those very early uh, bees uh, and pollinators 
it just gets them just takes the edge off that off, off the winter and it looks amazing and it grows it just spreads through your garden but not really in, um it's not a thug it's quite a delicate uh plant it, it just knows its place so i think that one as well is one of my essentials um dominic any suggestions what have you got in your garden uh -huh. i've got lots in my garden but actually can i just throw in a um a bit of support for ivy yeah because it's quite a controversial plant in many ways, but it is such a fantastic plant for insects, mm -hmm. especially as you were mentioning for later in the year when it flowers for all the uh, all the bees and and wasps. Um, yeah, um, I suppose on a more general level, just letting a few weeds grow wherever they they do. Actually, like behind you, um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, you know, dandelions are fantastic. And it's very easy to get them in. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just a, the natural ones need to be in the garden yeah. as well. But yeah, ivy was my kind of recommendation. To please don't take yeah. away too much of it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It is. And it's a great cover as well, isn't it? It's a great cover for overwintering insects and also birds. It is yeah. such an essential uh, plant for birds in the way it just uh, becomes this wall carpet of protection mm. for them um there was one that oh forget me not that one came to mind as well that's one that self seeds it's dead easy that supports lots of early bees um and yeah I th it's just such an easy plant to grow i don't tend to um go down the ornamental route so much I, in my front garden i'm pointing that way because that's where it is and i can see it. i've got things like alliums and geums which are okay in general but they're not, I can see that mainly outside at the moment, there's lots of male bumblebees and that's, that's not really that useful, I'm afraid. Um, but earlier on out there, you've got that long work, you've got the grape hyacinth, and then you've got the forget-me-not on the top of the garden. Um, Thrift is a really good one for lots of species of insect and fruit trees. If you can get a small pear or um, a plum tree, a spalier it up the fence, that's also, they're also great. Okay, what's your view of buddleia? Um, I never find it. It's not the most useful plant in my garden. I mean, it's dead easy and it grows everywhere and it's, it's it just does its thing, doesn't it? Um, mm. uh, but the leafcutter bees do like to use the foliage, so that it does have a purpose. Um, but I think um, I think I've got a lilac as well in my garden, and I find the buddleia is. More, it has more purpose than the lilac. I've only not cut the lilac down because it's grown into this lovely big structural um, tree and it would really disappoint the birds if I cut it down. But yeah, um, I do have my, my staples and I would say if anything, if I was going to put anything in that winter's honeysuckle would, would be the one. Great, thank you. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, uh, we have another question from Claire S. Is the, is the dry, hard ground where we've had less rain a problem, e.g. for the mining bees? It can be, yeah. Um, generally, um, the mining bees will be in loose or more open soil, so it's not going to, um, it's not going to be as clayey. Um, so some species won't be too affected by it. Um, what I would say is going back to the red mason bees and um, how the females need that wet mud um, in spring to construct their uh, nest cells and seal them up. They're really going to suffer uh, insects like that. Um, so if we can just create a little mud puddle in our gardens, uh, for the mason bees, that would be really useful for them. But um, yeah, it's 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 it all comes back to the sort of the climate change, the climate shift, weather pattern shifting, doesn't it? There are going to be some winners and losers. Some insects are going to find it more beneficial to have harder ground or um, a slightly different um, set of conditions. Others are going to find it much harder. Absolutely. Okay. Um question from Rod Hill. How do you recommend producing ponds as prefab ponds, prefabricated ponds tend to be steep sided? Oh, as in the, um, the moulded 
plastic is that that's what you mean isn't it rod yeah yeah um as dominic said earlier um ponds need to have a very uh, shallow shelf for various reasons it creates different um ecological levels in the pond for different species but also it's some it's a way for them to get out and if you are um using a a uh, flexible liner, you can custom build your pond around things like uh, if you've got plant roots, uh, if you suddenly, because everybody's going to dig down and at some, some point find that there's something obstructing where they want that uh, hard liner to go. So flexible liners do give you more flexibility with the shape of the pond, the angle um, of the shelf and any other sort of um, subterranean obstructions that might come your way that you might just have to work around. I've never used a hard liner. Um, uh, it felt like a good idea initially. I, I did think about buying a cheap one off eBay because um, they're probably a little bit stronger, but they're also rigid, so they might be more prone to cracking. Um, the majority of wildlife ponds I've seen uh, have been with flexible liners. Um, uh, would you add to that, Dominic? No, I think you've covered it, to be honest. I agree. Mm. No, I agree. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you, I bet you agree as well, Rod. You, you want to unmute? I bet you've got your own ideas about it. Yes. Yeah. Have, yes, you, have, yeah, yeah. I mean, have, have you got a it, pond, Rod? No, I've been, we've been thinking about putting one in. I'm just wondering the best way of going around. I mean, I, I realize all the things that you need. It, a step all the way down and a shallow round the edges but we were looking at prefabs and they're all steep sided so you can fill in um if you if the it depends if the sort of the step um the horizontal and the vertical if it's got quite a um a wide vertical you could fill it up with stones but i think gravity would just drag them down it's probably much better to have that very uh, gentle slope yeah one option might be to just um, set it a couple of inches deeper than you need to and put a liner around the outside. Yeah, possibly. The one thing I've always found about digging ponds is it's always a hell of a lot more effort than a, yeah. and a lot more soil <laughs> shifting yeah. than I anticipate. So that extra couple of inches might, yeah, might be a lot more work. Yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, a question from Emmy Lund. I work in a garden centre and I often find bugs that aren't native on imported plants. Should I release these? What should I do with them? Um, well, we shouldn't ever be purposefully releasing anything into the wider environment. Um, it's problematic because anything, especially with wings, will release itself if it's here. Um, it depends what it is. Some, some species are um, subject to control, aren't they? Um, off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember what they are. Um, some have naturalised into, into the area, into the country and are OK. Some are a little bit more of a problem. I would say that you probably can't do much about it on, a, on your personal level because insects are numerous and if they're breeding, um, you're probably not going to be able to control it yourselves, but it's worth finding out what they are and whether it is something that is reportable um, to DEFRA or to um, whichever organisation would be uh, responsible for that. Um, what would you say, Gary? Is that something that you've come across? Yeah, I, I can't remember the name of the organisation. I know someone who works for them as well. <laughs> um, but... But there, yeah, there's yeah, there's there's certain species that you the your your you have a duty to report if if you find uh, in a garden centre and but but otherwise if, then um, there's gonna be there's gonna be lots of native species among these as well and 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 some of them are gonna be very very similar to your non-native ones and being sure that it's a non-native is also a, potentially a problem um, but there's you know, there's thousands of garden centres. Uh, it's you know, it's, it's it's like coming across 
lots of harlequin ladybirds there's no, there's no real point in in sort of trying to stop them get out of your house or something but if there's a you know they shouldn't really be coming into the garden center should they i should they should be um so i suppose if there's a particular problem with a particular supplier then it would be good to report that to your manager or the the owner of the garden center and and try and raise if there's an issue but i i would go on to the yeah i, I can't remember the name of the organization but i would go on to their website and just get yourself familiar with with the things that you should be reporting and, and follow the procedures. Yeah, I, I, I've not really, yeah, come across that question particularly. It's a very good question. Colorado beetle is probably one of them, isn't it? Yes, it is, but it is. I think a lot of the, if any of the insects coming from a long way away, they probably won't survive anyway. But it's a very, very good question. I've never actually thought about that at all. Mm -hmm. I wonder what if there's a this should be a code of conduct or something for garden centers, shouldn't there? Because if they're importing plants which may have insects which have potential to cause problems, then that's a big, big deal, isn't it? Yeah, lots lots of insects are coming in, and lots of insects are record, recording new to Britain, aren't they, in garden centers at all? Very close to garden centers every year, and not many are able to naturalize, but I can't remember if the western conifer seed bug has come over in um, plant collections or if it's just made its own way over but there was um there was a, a, sh um, a shield bug that i was told about that was in a certain area it was kept quite secret because it's it's quite it's quite a lovely shield bug and it's not made its own way over it maybe had escaped from a polytunnel um but that would be a very welcome um addition to our fauna uh, they're not they they aren't all but th there are some insects that won't do any harm and like you said gary it's just a matter of um not um not mistaking them for anything that's harmful or that's already native because like you said there are some very similar species um thankfully yeah they're not all going to do harm but we do have to be careful because like you said dominic the colorado potato beetle um can do some harm and we do need to be mindful of that they don't have to do harm, do they? They can displace niches and mm. whatever. But that is that is harm in itself, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Great. Yeah. No. That, great question. Okay. Um, uh, looks like the last question uh, I've got here. Uh, one, another one from CL. I have a paved backyard. What would be your best advice for incorporating a water option in this setting? Mm. Um, so I'm assuming if it's paved, is it fa is a fairly impermeable surface? Uh, CL, are you still here? Um, so if it's if it's paved um i mean i've i've taken up some really hard impermeable paving and replaced it with soft paving which has got the gaps in the middle um and allows things to get in and out under the surface down to the soil and um, there's no reason why you couldn't take up a couple of paving slabs dig down and put a little bit of a liner in and create that mini pond or sink a, a bucket or a truck into it as i've done in my front garden not in paving slabs but just into the herbaceous border um, so that's definitely an option. Um, you could make um, a frog hotel, which is something that I saw in that that large nature reserve um, um, gold standard wildlife garden um, where you um, it's like a little pond, but it's much more grotty than that. It's uh, it's a, a little container that's sunk in and it's got um, it's got just lots of stones and lots of wood but the majority of it is stones and bark and wood and then you put some water down into it so it's um it's a bit it's a bit of a, a, a cesspit um and then things like frogs um and newts will go and and shelter in there another sort of semi-aquatic invertebrates so it doesn't have to be a classic pond it could be something a little bit more hybridized 
Great, yeah. This uh, I know people use old sinks and old baths and things that you can come up that uh, are pretty solid, aren't they? In terms of not leaking. Oh, Claire S has had we had a washing up bowl pond which had frog spawn and lots of life. So. Oh, brilliant! Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, okay, well, I don't see any any further questions in the chat. I'll just give a, a, a last opportunity for anyone who wanted to ask a question out loud. Anybody? No, no hands up. Oh, Carol. Would you like to unmute? Yeah. yeah. Um, would it be a good idea to make a book hotel using a terracotta pot and bamboo canes stuffed inside it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Short answer. Definitely. Um, you can um, you can also fill it with some soil sand substrate to stick the the canes in. Um, stuff all sorts of things in dead foliage, um, sticks, twigs, uh, in between the canes. Um, put the canes down to roughly the, the the height of the terracotta pot. Yeah. Um, yeah. That sounds absolutely great. Were you thinking of of turning it on its side so that the uh, canes are horizontal. Yeah, yeah. I work for um, Lancashire Wildlife Trust mm -hmm. um, on a project called the Bay, a blueprint for recovery in covering Morecambe Bay. Oh, and we're doing an event um, for the Queen's Jubilee and we're doing 70 book hotels for 70 years. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> oh, good luck with that. That's an amazing idea. Um, you can also do other things with terracotta pots. Um, you can sink them down into the ground and make those little um, sort of uh, frog hotels that I told you about. You can also um, submerge them partially into the ground the right way up um, at an angle so that there's a little gap, like a little entrance opening. Um, mm -hmm on the ground level which is going to be really good for um it's like a, a damp cool space for frogs and invertebrates and things to go in if it's near a pond or even if it's just mm. you know, a, a border anything like that creates um a shelter um uh, opportunity for smaller animals we do um have uh well-being sessions in woodlands and we've created a um, minaculum oh lovely yeah fantastic and they they can get loads of creatures in them and they're great in winter as well yeah yeah thank you oh brilliant good luck with that thanks thank you Hiring. yeah there's there's no more questions that i can see in the chat um but <clears throat> yeah as as rachel has just said you know uh thanks very much for, for a wonderful talk and uh and for and for both you, um, yourself and, and Dominic for, you know, answering so many of these questions and uh, really some, some just some great ideas some really good questions as well from the audience. And uh, yeah, lots of enthusiasm for improving gardens for invertebrates and uh, sure many would have taken tips from from tonight. So. Yeah, I think we'll um, we'll, we'll leave it there then. <laughs>